Hi, I'm Naisha McCauley, and you're watching AccessTV.org. You have just tuned into For the Greater Good with your host, Evelyn Richardson. And today, my special guest that I am very honored to have and be in his presence is Chief John B. Stewart. He's going to share with us about um, the work that he's done in the, he has done in the city of Hartford, um, how long he's been here or if he was born here, all those types of things. And then we're going to get down to some community discussions. Thank you so much, Mr. Chief Stewart, for joining me today. Thank you for having me. Thanks. So we're going to start with, um, tell us about Chief John B. Stewart, Jr. Who is he, where he comes from, and where is he now? Thank you. I was born and raised here in... Uh, the city of Hartford. My family, my grandmother, her sisters and brothers came from Greensboro, North Carolina. Actually, I, one of the first time I went down there was in my middle age days and I was looking for Sedalia and my grandmother said, we tell you the nearest big city. I said, great, because when I went through, I was out of it before I knew it. <laughs> so that's when they came here in 1893 mm -hmm. and settled in Glastonbury, Connecticut. Okay. Don't ask why, but all they knew, they were part of Hartford, they thought. <laughs> but... Uh, the family grew up in Hartford and East Hartford. Mm -hmm. And my grandmother is in the Jim's book of history. Mm -hmm. You probably remember 2007, one of her sisters, Mrs. Uh, Tillman. Tillman, yes. Tillman, Zion Church. Mm -hmm. She lived. During that time, she lived to be 114. Wow. And for one week, she was in the Jenner's history book Wonderful. as the longest living person in the world. Okay. And during the time that I was working on my book, and uh, my minister, former minister, Reverend Dr. Uh, Tendai, when he was here. I made him a Hartford Fire Department chaplain. When, when I became chief, I felt that we needed four chaplains okay. to represent everybody. And <clears throat> as a result of putting things together, when my great aunt was 114, I worked closely with the Genesis book of history. In addition to her being 114, it also went in the book because I had a great uncle all on my grandmother Stewart's side. Mm -hmm. And the great uncle did to be 108. Wow. From Glastonbury, East Hartford. He couldn't get a job here. So he um, went to uh, Boston, Mass and he lived the rest of his life there. So he lived to be 108. And my youngest great aunt, her and her husband migrated to Newark. And six years ago, she was 105. Wow. Some good genes yeah. running in that family, yeah. huh? <laughs> my grandmother, Amber, Amber Stewart, and her sister, um, <clears throat> in uh, Newark, New Jersey, on uh, Ada. She lived to be 102, my grandmother 102, and uh, 
my great uncle on 108 and then my great aunt 107. So they're in the book. There's five people in the family who lived to be over 100 years of age. Mm -hmm. So how long are you planning to be with us? I was 85 two months ago. <laughs> but I'm so, quite sure you're planning to be here much longer. So well, I you, know some, you might be in that book with them soon. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. But uh, my father lived to be 86, mm -hmm. unfortunately, uh, 1996. Mm -hmm. He was 86 at that time. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know. Um, so tell I us about it. your history with the police, um, not the police yeah. department, but the fire department. Well, you, I guess I was blessed. Um, when I was um, 18, the city of Hartford changed from a strong mayor, former government, to a city manager. It meant the city manager is the person that runs the city. Mm -hmm. And the mayor is a ceremony, more or less weak mayor. Okay. Now, who was that mayor at that time, and who was that city manager? City manager came in. I forgot who the strong mayor was. Okay. Uh, can't think. But anyway, the city manager, the first one we had was Carlton Sharp. Okay. Under the city manager for former government, the city manager is the top administrator. Mm -hmm. They called the mayor in those days. Uh, it was a strong mayor that ran the city. And you had to know him or somebody on the council. They didn't have examinations. Mm -hmm. Your friendship or your knowledge would get you there. Right. But in 1948, the system promised the African-American community they would actively recruit African-Americans for the fire department. Basically, if you jump back to 1918, um, there was one person of color that was working on the fire department. Because up until then, you had to know somebody or know who it is. Mm -hmm. uh, our first actual black firefighter was William Henry Jacklin. Okay. And in 1918, they decided it's going to be a paid department and not a volunteer. Okay. However, they told them, if he wants to come on board, there's nowhere for him to sleep. They would, they would not work with them. So 1918? They, that's when they, they started so. to pay the department. Okay. Well, what has evolved is you jump forward to 1948, and they hired 125 new firefighters. And like the city manager, Carlton Shop promised, there were six African Americans that started. One only lasted two years. Mm -hmm. It wasn't his cup of tea. Mm -hmm. The other five lived to see the 25th year in the fire department, and they retired. Now, there had yeah. to be a lot of racism um, through that, throughout that journey. Yeah, yeah, it was a long time. Mm -hmm. I was 18 at the time, and you had to be 20, mm -hmm. 21. To, uh, and you couldn't come on. You could get take a test. They put you on a list. Mm -hmm. And when you became 21, oh, okay, that's then okay. they'd do it. Okay. And with my cousin, Frank G. Davis Jr., mm -hmm. he was the first one to get promoted. They set up the civil service, and they said to us, who had a better educational level than the average person because they had their <laughs> affirmative action their okay. own way. Their own way. Mm -hmm. Up to that, most of the firefighters were Irish. Some came over from Ireland. Some had been here. 
the job didn't pay much. And it seems like, you know, they assimilated into the fire department mm -hmm. and the police department too. Mm -hmm. When he passed the test, that meant he'd knock out the person that had the position. Mm -hmm. And we were asked not to take the test because of our educational level. Most of us, some had college, all of us had graduated from high school. So naturally, our knowledge and the tests that they gave, they were afraid if all six of us took it, you're gonna knock out mm -hmm. the drivers that are there. Those that were drivers, paid lieutenants, captain, deputy chief, assistant chief, or promotional mm -hmm. exam. Uh, I didn't take it. It's 1950. Willingly Three. or unwillingly? Well, I mean, you know, we, not that you we, we put up a fight, but that, you know, within your heart, there was some resistance oh, yeah, is what I'm asking. Yeah. Okay. Definitely, because we knew all of us had at least a high school diploma. Mm -hmm. And in those days, you know, when we get into the high school, we're not encouraged to even finish high school. Wow. All the things, naturally, I'm skipping around mm -hmm. and what happened. So they, we were stationed on Main and Bellevue Street downtown. The other station was further downtown opposite the uh, police department headquarters. Result is there were some people upset the fact that um, we took the test and they didn't leave us in our territory so that <laughs> our people can see you. In those days, everybody just about walked to work. Mm -hmm. And the heavily um, um, African-American from Main Street and Albany Avenue all the way up to Tar Avenue and along Albany Avenue. So naturally, you know, so they put us at Main and Belden Street, and that house and the one that was Company 3 on downtown, opposite the police station, they had separate beds, separate beds. So they didn't want to sleep in the bed that the nope. black man slept they in, huh? So when I came, when I came along, um, I didn't realize that at Maine and Belden, there were south side, north side, separate rooms. So everybody had their own room. But the shift they put me on, they put me on the shift with Ben Laurie, who since 48 had established himself as a good candidate for lieutenant driver. Okay. But he didn't want to. They didn't want to. Frank Davis did. And when he got promoted, he knocked out the driver that was there. Mm -hmm. So they punished him. They put him up on Blue Avenue. <laughs> and in the fire department, when you went to 16s on Blue Hills mm -hmm. or 9 straight down the end of the city, right. that's like blackballing you, putting mm -hmm. you out to the suburbs. Because the mentality of the fire service then was talking about the big one, mm -hmm. talking about the rescue. Mm -hmm. I was asked if I wanted to have the NAACP come in. Mm -hmm. And at that time, Dr. Frank Simpson, who was the first person of color, he was the first person in the state, the civil rights mm -hmm. uh, affirmative action mm -hmm. state office. And he says, you got to stick in there. It'll all be gone. You're going to what we call the pioneering mm -hmm. employment. But that led to um, when I finally took the test. And I was not a veteran. I was in Naval Reserve. Mm -hmm. um, the ones that were veterans were in the service. When they finished the test, 
whatever they got, they added five points. Mm -hmm. And if you were a disabled veteran, and with the puzzle we had firefighters they hired, they had knee problems, arm problems, or something. How they supposed to pick me up out of a fire? Well, the whites will pick you up. The blacks can't. <laughs> oh, <laughs> goodness. But uh, all of us, everybody's discipline mm -hmm. went through, except that our job was not an easy job. I bet. And the thing that we had to be careful is that it's usually a buddy-buddy system. Mm -hmm. One works out, work, one looks out for the other. Mm -hmm. And so what we marveled at is when the bell hit and we got to the fire scene, the white firefighters would break their neck to rescue you mm -hmm. and work their head off. Mm -hmm. When we went back in quarters, sometimes they didn't bother to sit with us. Mm -hmm. Wow. And sometimes they, like we have watches six to nine, nine to 12, 12 to two, two to four, and four to eight. Nights were six at night to eight in the morning. That had to, uh, must have felt very conflicted that we can operate in public, yeah. but behind the scenes we're very yeah. disconnected. Right. I want to um, bring you up because our yeah, time is um, going down, right. has went down, but okay. um. How do you view the um, fire department today? There's a lot of dynamics, especially in the African-American community and the African-American um, firefighters that's going on these days. And what's your sentiments, your feelings about that? Well, <clears throat> that's why this recent task force, because of those headlines we've been having, in particular around the death of Kevin mm -hmm. Bell, is that the mayor formed a task force and I was elected chair. Okay. It was Nelson Carter, who took my place when I retired. He was the vice chair. And Eddie Caceres, mm -hmm. who was one of the first Hispanic firefighters that I recruited when I was in the captain and special services. Mm -hmm. And then Charles Teal mm -hmm. uh, and the police chief. He was on there because we had discipline problems and he doesn't seem to have those. Um, when we got through and made our recommendations, if there was still a way, if the mayor and the city council, personnel department, mm -hmm. take our recommendations, it could give back the overall balance in the department. We went down when the assistant chief retired. Nobody wanted to take the job because you had to move in from the outside. When we got uh, halfway through, we made the strong recommendation that you put back those two assistant chiefs. Mm -hmm. The chief cannot do it by himself. Mm -hmm. Somebody needs to be in charge of firefighting the others is support services. Mm -hmm. And when you don't have it, and the assistant chief and the chief are the only three out of the union. Mm -hmm. So the chief was allowed to pick a retired firefighter. Mm -hmm. And those two persons would then be in that role of assistant chief. We're still in the middle of seeing our results mm -hmm. further evaluated. And we're waiting to see how long the human resources and the corporation council's office mm -hmm. and the mayor and city council get together and fill, let the chief fill that position. That has cut down the things you used to read about mm -hmm. in the bank. Chief by himself cannot run the 350 uh, people, firefighters, by himself. And, and that's then, what had been going on. Yep. Okay. No control. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You don't know what's going on. It's, it's deputy chiefs 
and the captain. So each house, each company has a captain, a lieutenant under them. And they were not adhering to the rules and regulations of the city or of the fire department. So we, we're still watching. Okay. We have the chief appointed pending an examination, mm -hmm. which will also allow outsiders mm -hmm. to apply for it. Okay, we're going to have to yeah. stop right here. It was wonderful listening to the stories. Yeah. And I got to have you back for a 30 minute show because I have okay. a lot of more questions, a lot more questions to yes. ask you. Yes, Thank sir. you for joining us. We'll be right back in a few seconds with our next guest. Our next guest is Mayor Pedro Segarra's campaign manager, Mr. Michael Bland. Don't leave. Right back. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Summer is almost here, and it's not too early to start thinking about summer programs and activities for your child. They are important for all children, so they won't lose what they learn during the school year over the summer. This way, they will be ready for the first day of school in the fall. And make sure you plan your summer vacation for the days after summer school ends, right before the new school year begins. Remember, learning happens every day. How do you judge a law firm's success? Cases won, money made, or what the firm does in the community? At Dressler Strickland, we know that success is just the beginning. The true measure of success is what you do with it. For 33 years, we've used our success to help our neighbors and our community. 24 7, 11 22. Whenever you need us, we'll be there. Dressler Strickland, building communities one case at a time. Every hero has a story. I'm attorney Jeffrey Dressler. Hartford Public Library, Hartford Public Schools, and Meg Education present a summer of power. Weekly celebrations of learning at a different Hartford Public Library branch. Ice cream for a dream, cocoa key passes, and computer tablets every week. See Hartford Public Library website on how to win the mega summer learning cup for your school. Supported by La Bomba, Telemundo, Ice Cream for a Dream, and Mega Education. Welcome back. Okay, so we're sitting here with um, the campaign manager for Mayor Pedro Segarra. And you know that election season is here. It ain't even amongst us no more. It is slap dab in the middle, smack dab in the middle here. So we're gonna talk to Michael Bland. Welcome to the show. Thank you, Ms. Richardson. Thank you for having me. Okay, so tell us a little bit about yourself before we get into some questions. Now, you know, I don't know if that's a good idea. That may take up the whole show. <laughs> that's what I said a little because young know, Chief Stewart, he, he spent a bit there too. <laughs> well, um, I'm a New Jersey native. Um, and I like to say between New Jersey and Virginia, I was born in uh, Virginia Beach, Virginia. Uh, okay. My mother went to school at Norfolk State University, and my father was originally from Virginia Beach, so I was born there. And then I believe at the age of five, I went to, uh, we moved back to New Jersey. Okay. Um, and that's where my mother grew up, uh, Navis Sink, Long Branch, New Jersey. Um, so I went there, went through the school system there, public school system there. Um, was all state and track and field, football, um, class president. <laughs> <laughs> um, <Go figure. laughs> class president, uh, you know, 
and then attended uh, Milford Academy Prep School, University of Rhode Island. Um, then went on when I immediately believe in that when I came back to Long Branch, um, I decided with then my fiance, um, who in turn became my wife uh, about a month, about a year and a half later, <laughs> uh, to run for city council uh, with a group of friends. Uh, who and where is me. this in New Jersey? In, in New Jersey, in Long Branch, okay. New Jersey. And then, um, you know, we, we just took off from there. I, I lost, um, 22 years old. I don't know how many 22 year olds. I went to city council <laughs> in a big city. Uh, but I came in seventh out of 21. It was the most mm -hmm. candidates to ever run for public office in our okay. city. So uh, it was good. It was good. Um, so from there, as you know, I went on to um, to, to be the uh, deputy region field director on President Obama's uh, reelection campaign in North Carolina, in the northeast quarter of the state. Um, then from there, um, previously, but before that, worked on uh, Governor Corzine's reelection campaign. Um, and then worked on Congressman Frank Pallone's his special reelect for um, the special election for the Senate seat for the late Senator Lautenberg. Um, then worked on most recently Congresswoman Essie's campaign as a field director. Uh, afterwards, after winning reelection, became a political director. And then now I'm here. So it's like, that's I, where I wanted you to get. Now, how <laughs> did we get you here? How did where did Mayor Sagara meet you and 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 convince you to come to little old Hartford, Connecticut? <laughs> You know, uh, it, it's a crazy story, right? So it, it goes all the way back to December. Um, mm -hmm. And this is what some people know when I say, as you, you know, I'm a man of God and, 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 and I believe things happen for a reason. Mm -hmm. um, it goes all the way back to December. I had just recently signed my contract with the Congresswoman. Some folks had met me on a campaign trail with the Congresswoman. Okay. And I, I wasn't quite ready to leave yet, being I just signed a contract. Mm -hmm. And, you know, time passes by, things happen. And then I was contacted again by some folks. And I said, I don't want to do it. You know, I, I, I don't want to put my family through another campaign. I don't want to go through another campaign. It's stressful, you know, you know, eat right, you know, diet right. And, and here you are. And, and then here I am. And uh, as my pastor will say, let it not be strange. Mm -hmm. So, you know, here I am. So tell us about Mayor Sagara so, and, and your, your work for him. Why, I, why do you feel that Sagara is, because I'm thinking, you know, with my limited knowledge of politics, that if you actually are the campaign manager, you strongly believe that the person is the best candidate. Oh, without a doubt. Listen, uh, Mayor Cigar is one of the most genuine politicians I've ever met. And, you know, you can't say that a lot. You know, last night I happened to be in a barbershop. I think it was Premier, Premier Cuts um, over on Signy Avenue. Okay. And, you know, it was late, about 7, 30, 8 o'clock. Um, and I had asked the young man, are you, you know, are you going to vote this year? He says, I don't vote, man. You know, these politicians aren't for us. I said, well, who, who? And I said, you know, who's running? And he was going down the gambit. And mm -hmm. I said, you forgot the mayor. Mm -hmm. um, he goes, oh, he's going to win. I said, well, we're not going to take it for granted. And I said, you know, one of the things that the mayor, I think, besides his story, I mean, his story is a tremendous story. And he's a man of faith. And you talk about a guy who can stand out in front of the issues of social injustice, uh, being Latino. Uh, being, you know, uh, openly gay, mm -hmm. um, and 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 being a part of this movement for such a long time, but also understanding that he was a guy who understood uh, gun violence firsthand, having to lose his father, mm -hmm. to, uh, you know, gun violence, um, and then his two of his best friends from New York uh, were killed due to gun violence, which brought him to Harvard mm -hmm. at the fine age of fifteen. So, um, you know, that his story alone uh, was what propelled me to be here, and on top of. You know the things that he's done, and and I hear the argument every day, whether we you know, we're on a campaign trail or we're out and about. Um, you know, it's it's tough to govern and campaign at the same time. Mm -hmm. But however, when you inherit uh, what what the mayor inherited, um, especially if you think back to the worst economical crisis that the country mm -hmm. felt, um, and and again, what that effect had on Harvard and what he's now been able to do, revigorate the city. Uh, you know, economic development is back up, right? Um, more housing development. Um, money, you know, money's into my brother's keeper initiative, you know, by being proactive on the police and with the body cameras and the street cameras um, and him understanding those nuances and putting, I believe, is one point two million dollars in his most recent budget in his, into a uh, summer youth employment program. So you, you, if you just look at those things alone. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and say, you know, here's a guy who, who literally understands his city and understands what needs to be, you know, what needs to happen. And, you know, even when people raise the issue about taxes, I say, I say in the mill rate, I said, um, you would go to some cities and, and some mayors would take office and lie to you and, and say, you know, I'll never raise taxes. I won't do this. Or I won't do that. 
But this guy understands that the the disparities in his city, um, he cannot afford to escalate taxes. Um, it would diminish the culture in Hartford. And, and this is one of the most culturally rich places I've ever seen in my life. And he understands that and he's not willing to let that go um, because of a few cents and dollars. And you know, that may insult some folks, but I think at all in all, it, it's, it gives us a firm understanding of who this guy is and what goes on his day. I mean, what goes on his mind from day to day, day nuances. Okay, so some I, I hear people talking about, and even um, Chief Stewart kind of alluded to, not present day, but in the past, about the weak mayor, strong mayor, and then the weak mayor being more of a ceremonial mayor, and the strong mayor being the one that heads up the city. And there's a lot of complaints out there that um, although the title strong mayor is in possession of Sagara, that he hasn't shown that he can be a strong mayor. What are your thoughts about that? And what would you say to those people who are making those types of comments? Well, look, it, it, it's simple to point the finger, right? It's mm -hmm. simple to um, cultivate a leader in your mind. Um, that's something you may see on a national scale mm -hmm. and suggest that maybe what you need here in Hartford, right? But you have to look at the, you know, the strong mayor concept um, and what Mayor Pedro Cigar brings to the table. Mm -hmm. One of the things, again, which I admire, he's a collaborative leader. Um, he's a guy that brings people to the table and, and not just always says, you know, I'm going to do it. You know, forget about everybody else. I want to do it because I think it makes the most sense. He's done that time and time and time again, whether it be closed doors, meeting, and, and people have raised eyebrows about that. But you know what? It's not always about the press conferences and bringing me, you know, folks from the media in. It's getting to the nut, nuts and bolts. And you know what? When you bring sometimes when you bring the media in, uh, and, and, you know, people are, are not reluctant to say what's really on their mind. Um, because folks are there who don't really understand what's going on and, and may have a different agenda mm -hmm. um, once somebody from the media may come in. Um, and what I would tell them is get to know the man. You know, do the research on the city. Think about what the mayor had to inherit. Um, think about some of the things that he's had to deal with. And even with some of the complaints, I say, yeah, you know what? That's not just Hartford. That's everywhere. everywhere. <laughs> you know, you, it, 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 and it's, it's not just any city. It's the capital city. It's the gateway to New England. And, you know, again, this guy continually, and I can tell you whether it's, you know, call time or campaigning, when we're out going door to door together um, or we're doing call time, the guy time and time again is dealing with city issues. Um, and again, this is not an easy job, but he he takes the city, you know, he puts the city first um, and he brings other people. He, he listens to folks' opinions just, and just doesn't say, oh, I, I'm personally just going to make the right decision. No, because there's so many nuances that go that, that go into any one decision. And he understands that. And collaboratively bringing folks together, he gets it. Um, so when folks say he's not a strong leader, says, you know, you know, I always say, you know, it's like when our coach got fired at URI, you know, mm -hmm. folks were so excited. And I said, you know, guys, relax. I, you know, I'd rather like the devil I know than the devil I don't know. I know um, so and and that's not just to say that's the case here, but everything sounds good in the plan. But show me a guy who has the experience. Show me a guy who can resemble with folks in the community. Show me the guy who went through the tough times with you. And that was help bringing us out of those tough times and just doesn't put a bandaid on things. And he goes in and he does triage and he does surgery. That's a leader. Um, and, and he does collaborate with other folk. So okay. that's what I would say. OK, so um, you said that you were at the barber shop and the young man, I don't know how old he is, but I'm assuming he's younger than me. And the young man said that the mayor is going to win. Is there any I mean, I know that like on television during the um, presidential campaigns, they kind of like show you the numbers or the polls or they do things like that. Do we have anything like that telling us um, that Mayor Cigar is popular or is he unpopular at this time? You know, uh there are things, there are avenues and vehicles in place, um, which we, you know, we like to keep internal. Um, but, you know, let, let's talk about the street operation and okay. the folks who are out on doors. Mm -hmm. um, he is, you know, it's different because everybody says they like the mayor. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when we say, well, you support the mayor, mm -hmm. oh, without a doubt. Again, being at the park yesterday, um, I'm out about with the mayor, and I think we were over by Elizabeth Park, and there was a young lady who was doing the, um, lunch services. Okay. And I walk over, introduce myself, and told I was a campaign manager for the mayor, and she was maybe shocked for obvious reasons. <laughs> <laughs> You're not a Puerto Rican? <laughs> so, you know, and we're talking, and she goes, I love this guy. And she goes, do you know his story? And, you know, respectfully, I'm like, yes, ma'am. She goes, no, but do you know his story? And she goes on to tell me his story, and she goes, 
that's a guy I want to, you know, that's a guy that needs to continue to lead our city forward. So, you know, again, it's like you get the grass tops and you get the grassroots folks, right? Mm -hmm. What's the difference? How do we bring that together and delve out, you know, mm -hmm. the, the stuff that doesn't make sense, right? Um, but, you know, we know that he's doing well, um, whether it be the poll or what we hear on the street or what we hear on the doors. We know he's doing well, but the fact of the matter is it doesn't matter till September 16th when the folks get out right. and vote in the primary. And, you know, I've said it once on, not this show, but on a particular show. Um, Get out and vote, you That's know, right. <laughs> um, register to vote. It's a process that takes mm -hmm. 10 seconds. It's a process that expresses your freedom. It's a process that people died for. It's a process that people fought for. It's a process that, you know, still folks in Congress believe that you should go through loops and bounds to just express your, 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 your given right in this country. Um, so, you know, I tell folks all the time, although I care, but I don't care. I mean, go vote. It's the most important vehicle we have in this country in expressing that freedom. So, Michael, some people would say that you are a token um, campaign manager. What is your response to that? <laughs> I've a heard token it. black <laughs> campaign manager. I've heard it a lot, right? And, and, and again, I like to tell folks, don't ever mistake activity for achievement. Mm. Um, I, I, I believe or want to believe my track record speaks for itself. There you go. Um, and, you, you know, if you don't know me, get to know me. Um, mm -hmm. And I'm not one to just throw in your face what I've done and this is my track record. No, let's sit down and have the conversation. The mayor could have picked anybody that he wanted. And at first, you know, we know there were people that were um, out in front of his campaign before as his campaign manager. Right, and right. again, I said, let's go back. Let it not be strange. You know, God had a plan, uh, had a divine plan before we did. Mm -hmm. And um, I think that, you know, if you, if you want to call it a token, that's fine. But let me be the token that speaks for you. Mm -hmm. OK, um, I'm somebody who's now at the table for us. Mm -hmm. So when we say, um, you know, we don't know what kind of connection we have with the mayor, you know, being African-American and, and sitting with this man every day and having uh, particular conversations with the mayor every single day, I'm reminded that I'm not a token, but I'm standing on the shoulders of giants mm -hmm. and I'm standing on the shoulders of my grand, my grandmother, my great grandmother, who was a maid up until she was about 85 years old and she could have retired. I'm standing on the shoulders of giants of folks like my mother, who was the region two small business administrator. Mm -hmm. um, and, and when I was a child, she used to sell furniture at Jennifer Convertible. Mm -hmm. um, I'm standing on the shoulders of giants of my father who was killed when I was, uh, I believe, two years old. Um, and I'm standing on his, his shoulders. So when folks, and I'm standing on the shoulders of my uncle, David Brown, who, um, again, they, they, they weren't poor, but they, um, they understood being, you know, being raised by a single mother, six, six of my uncles and aunts, um, that he would become an executive director of uh, Long Branch Housing Authority, Camden Housing Authority, Irvington Housing Authority, and would be a national figure and visit the White House um, with, with President Reagan as the a uh, student body president at Norfolk State University. Those are the, those are the shoulders I'm standing on. So if you say I'm a token, know my story before you, you know that you before you point the finger. I'm not I'm not a token. I'm an example. So our last question, because our time is running out, my last question rather is: If the mayor wins, where is Michael Bland? <laughs> you know, I get this question a lot. Um, again, I, I I look. I'm worried about winning first. Um, and do I want to stay in Hartford? Absolutely. You know, I, I've told my family that um, this place, I love the culture diversity. I love that you can go, again, up to Dunn's River in the North End, um, that you can go to... Oh, plug for Dunn's. <laughs> you know, that you can go to the South End and enjoy, that you can go to the Russell, um, a, a, a Black-owned uh, restaurant who, that's been in for roughly 10 years, that you can go to a Black-owned cigar shop and maybe have a cigar um, at the cigar shop over on Pratt, on Pratt Street. Um, I, I love the... You you know, the park set. I love the Elizabeth Street Park or, or mm -hmm. you know, so, you know, the theater, the Bushnell Theater, it, it's a great place. It's a great place to raise your children and the options that you have um, with the schools and the opportunities to allow, again, to bring us, you know, folks that look like you and I um, and that look like other folks to bring us together and, and, and to create um, to excuse me to inoculate that culture divide and I want to bring it I want to be here to strengthen those relationships okay. so I believe I'll be there okay I'm gonna give you one minute to speak into your camera and tell us why Sagara is the best candidate to vote for for mayor you know look Harford you have a choice uh, on September 16th you can either um, press the reset button or you can continue the path forward to victory there are challenges that have been uh, that have been set before this guy and this man has continually met him head on. Um, nobody is perfect. I, I'm reminded as a, when I worked for the president in 2012 on his campaign that he promised this wouldn't take, this may not take a year, this may not take two years, this may not even take a first term. 
but it takes time. And understanding municipal government and understanding that this man puts his city first, that he puts the youth of the city first, that education is his first priority, that the resources and, 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 and the nuances that he's putting into our educational system matter the most. Um, you have a choice to make. And if Pedro Cigar is not your first choice, um, I ask you to reconsider. I ask you to go visit our website at www.cigara2015.com. I ask you to visit his Facebook page. I ask you to visit his Twitter and, and, and look at the issues that matter to him the most. And don't worry, if you don't get a chance to visit him on our, our website, he'll be coming to knock on your door. Thank you very much, Michael. Thank you. Look forward to seeing you soon. And thank you all for tuning in to For the Greater Good with your host, Evelyn Richardson. And I'll see you next week. Be blessed.